Our speaker tonight is Dr. Sherwin Newland. Uh, he's an American surgeon and author who teaches bioethics, history of medicine, and medicine at the Yale University School of Medicine, and upon occasion, bioethics and history of medicine at the Yale College. I am using the Wikipedia entry on him because the bio he gave me is too short. It's like a couple of sentences, so I, I want to say a little bit more. His 1994 book, How We Die, Reflections on Life's Final Chapter, was a New York Times bestseller and won the National Book Award for Nonfiction, as well as being a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. In 2011, Dr. Newland was awarded the Rhodes Gold Medal of the American Philosophical Society for, contrib for contributions to medicine. Newland has written non-academic articles for the New Yorker, the New York Times, the New Republic, Time, and the New York Review of Books. Perhaps his greatest work, however, is his first generation American autobiography of his own painful coming of age as a son of immigrants, lost in America, a journey with my father. He is a fellow of the Hastings Center, an independent bioethics research institution. Um, so uh, among his many books, uh, and, and there are many, is The Soul of Medicine, The Art of Aging, The Doctor's Plague, uh, Doctors, the Biography of Medicine, How We Die, How We Live, Leonardo da Vinci, Maimonides, uh, The Mistress Within, The Wisdom of the Body, and The Uncertain Art, Thoughts on Our Life in Medicine. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Newland to the stage. Well, this is, this is wonderful. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, this is uh, really an hour that I've been waiting for for a long time. It's not as if I have a particular message to bring to you. I have an enormous message to bring. And you know, I brought three pages of notes, four pages of notes, so that I could decide what I thought was most important. But it's the word humanities uh, that, that got me. And then talking to Dr. Uh, Professor Majid today at lunch made me decide that we're going to focus on the humanities because I consider medicine one of the humanities. I don't consider medicine a science. I consider medicine thought to be by our young doctors the art that the Greeks told us it was. Now when I say Greeks and I say humanities, it means I better start talking about the Greeks and humanities. So I'm going to begin with the Greeks. The cradle of Western civilization, of course, is that golden age of Greece, 500, 400, 300 before the Common Era, when People were, oh, are we having audio problems? I always get worried when the producer gesticulates. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how's this? Oh, oh, good, 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 good. I didn't say anything I, you know, <laughs> up, up till now. Uh, when people walked around with names like Demosthenes and Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and one of the most remarkable things about this period of time is that one of the men who walked around with an unusual name, at least for our time, was a fellow called Hippocrates. Hippocrates lived, just to give you some time orientation, almost concurrently with the life of Plato. He lived about 100 years, so he was alive when Socrates took that famous drink, and he was alive when Aristotle was born. But he is not the person who gave us modern medicine, surprisingly. We always say Hippocrates, but what we mean is a school of physicians of which he was a leading figure, but there were many other leading figures, that over the course of something like 200 years, wrote a series of about 80 books that transformed the way doctors conceived of disease, the way doctors treated disease. Now, if this 
notion of the passage of hundreds of years when a particular book or series of books was written sounds familiar. It's precisely what happened with our Bible, with, with the Western uh, so-called Judeo-Christian Bible. Clearly, we know it was written over periods of hundreds of years. It was not dictated to Moses. I hope that doesn't offend anybody in the room. If your name is Moses, it might, but otherwise, I think we all know better than that by now. And this is the way it was with Hippocrates. Now, what, what did he do? What did he do that gives us lessons for taking care of people today. You don't mind if I say he when I mean all of these physicians. In the first place, at the time of his arrival on the scene, the arrival of this group of physicians, it was thought that one became ill because one had not treated the gods properly. One hadn't behaved properly. And the way one got better was to go to a so-called Esculapian temple. Esculapius, is the god of healing. We all know him. And to pray in the temple to allow one's sick parts to be licked by the sacred snakes that wandered around, which is where we get that thing that is not the caduceus, but is actually the Hippocratic uh, uh, stake. And if you did it right, you were cured. Uh, Hippocratic said, no, 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 and that doesn't really make any sense to us. You get sick because things happen in nature. Things happen in your body. Things happen with the winds. Things happen with malarial ponds, uh, things happen with the food you eat, uh, the internal body gets injured, and our job is to treat these natural diseases with natural medicines or diet or, or other measures. And that was a revolutionary thing. As a matter of fact, uh, the Hippocratics have been said to live through the time of, quote, the Declaration of Independence of Medicine. They did other things. They were the first people to keep records. So when they saw patients, each of them kept a careful record and used it to teach their students. And teaching was an obligation, also a new thing. They developed the concept of the physical examination, which was quite different than it is today. Nobody had a stethoscope. They put an ear to the chest, and they learned what the sounds represented. But there were two aspects of their creed and credo that have meaning for us, especially as we consider the way in 21st century America we deal with the end of life. One of them is the concept of prognosis. In the Greek, pro, beforehand, gnosis, to know. Trying to figure out, based on the examination, on the history, and what they knew of their own experience, whether the treatment that they were going to give would really prevent a patient from dying. Now, they were interested in prognosis for a number of reasons, but the primary one was they did not want patients to suffer. We have to think about this because how different that is from today. They would step back once they realized that the likelihood of their being successful in their treatment was decreasing significantly. Uh, of course, nowadays, if there's a 10% chance, you go right at it. The Hippocratics would never do such a thing. Uh, they understood that this was not what families needed. They certainly understood this is not what patients needed. Of course, there were no intubations at that time. There were no pacemakers. There was no CPR. But there was plenty that one could do to make a dying person's life miserable anyway. So <laughs> they stepped back. The other thing that they did, for which we remember them so well, is they brought to us, to medicine in general, a concept of ethics. Now, not just ethics, but the concept that the physician must be a moral person. And for the purposes of what I'm going to say this evening, I differentiate between ethics 
and morality. I think they're two different things. I think ethics uh, really consists of a code of rules, a code of laws that a group or a society follows. Morality is what you really do. Morality is what you learn at the knee of your mother or your minister as you're growing up, and your basic morality is not changed by joining a group like the American Medical Association as your ethics are. Now, I want to give some illustrations of what I mean by the physician's morality, because in these 80 books, in addition to the oath which we all know about, there are books called ethics, there are books called precepts, there are books called on decorum, there are books called the physician, which talk about the image that the physician should have with his patients. And I'll read some of the quotes. Uh, this doesn't sound like ethics to me. Quote, with purity and holiness, I will pass my life and practice my art. That's morality. In the book called Precepts, where love of mankind is, there is also love of the art of medicine. Love of mankind. I have not been present at any teaching session of medical students for a very long time where anybody talked about love of mankind. Incidentally, a basic principle of Socratic philosophy, as you know, of Platonic philosophy, less so with Aristotle, but an important basis of, of Western thought in general. And here's one. Some patients, though conscious that their condition is perilous, recover their health simply through their contentment with the goodness of the physician. About 10 years ago, I started on a project that fascinated me simply because of that term, the goodness of the physician. I call the project the goodness of the physician. And I studied what happened to the concept of goodness, what happened to the concept of, of virtue, of the doctor's personal morality, of the, of the way the image of the physician influenced cure, influence the relief of symptomatology, what happened to it after the period of the Greeks and going on through the Roman period, which was really just an extension of the Greek period, at least in medicine, and what happened in the Middle Ages and what happened later when the Renaissance occurred and goodness knows uh, science came into the picture. You don't read very much about the goodness of the physician nowadays. You know when the goodness of the physician is paramount, when it is most important, it is near the end of life. And I don't mean the last week, I don't mean the last month, I mean when it becomes apparent that the old Greek concept of prognosis tells us the odds are against us that whatever we do, there is some chance of recovery, but the chance is too slim to justify what the patient has to go through. One of the wisest things I've ever heard at a meeting of our uh, bioethics committee at the Yale New Haven Hospital was an experienced ICU nurse saying, uh, for some people, it just simply isn't worth what they get out at the other end of all of this. And I think for a lot more people than we have acknowledged until now. So the Hippocratics gave us this code we call the code of ethics, the Hippocratic Oath, other places, but more importantly, they gave us the notion that we are a moral profession, that the personal virtue, image, morality of the physician is a factor in healing. And they left us with these two notions, both of which seem to have been stepped all over in the late 20th century. By the late 20th century, I mean the age of technology, 1960s, and on up. Well, Greek medicine was Roman medicine. If you went to a properly trained uh, Roman physician in the year 200 of the Common Era. Uh, he would have read all of the Greek classics. He would have read the works of Hippocrates and certain other people, uh, a man named Galen who thrived during the Roman Empire, uh, and would be imbued with the kinds of moral concepts I'm talking about. Well, 
uh, Rome uh, lasted a long time, but it, it finally, eventually, uh, in the fourth century, uh, Rome went down the drain, and the, and the empire, as you know, was transferred to the eastern, to the Byzantine Empire. And what happened to those 80 books and what happened to the other Greek writings? Uh, to be saved, they were sent to Constantinople. And the only people who read them came on the scene later. And who were they? Well, remember that uh, Muhammad was born in the 6th century, the year usually given is 570. Within 100 years, a tremendous milit series of military victories had ceded all of North Africa and much of Southern Europe to uh, the newly arising Muslim empire. And unlike uh, the Westerners, unlike us, it didn't take 1,500 years for a renaissance. They had the renaissance right away. They got a hold of the Greek manuscripts and they studied the Greeks. And they agreed that one gets sick for natural reasons. They agreed that treatment should have to do with herbs or botanicals or changes in diet or changes of location, things of this nature. And you know who disagreed? Who disagreed was the Christian church. The Christian church, based as it was, of course, on suffering, on the value of suffering. Think of those early saints sitting on tops of flagpoles or whatever they did for 30 years and, and then becoming sainted. Virtue, pain, misery was considered a virtue and one got sick if one had violated Christian precepts and if you got sick and you were sick unto death, you were not permitted by several papal declarations to go visit a doctor. In fact, monks and priests, the best educated people of the time, were not permitted to practice medicine. Meantime, where were the great physicians? They were in the Muslim empire. They were in North Africa. They were in what we now call the Middle East. And they were in Persia. And they had names that are familiar to some people here. Uh, the greatest of all, uh, although we disagree about this, uh, you say Razis, I say Avicenna, who, who was a Persian. Uh, but uh, Hali Abbas, a, a large group of them, Maimonides and uh, Isaac Judaeus, who were Jews but who wrote in Arabic and studied medicine in Arabic and were essentially Aristotelians while the work of Aristotle had been lost to Western Europe. If you read the texts that were left to us by these great men of medicine, what do they talk about? In addition to the Greek treatments, they talk about virtue. They talk about goodness. They talk about the doctor at the bedside and how he behaves in the home of a patient, and how he becomes, I keep thinking of the transference in psychoanalysis, how he becomes the image of goodness and health, thereby helping the patient to try to develop those characteristics himself. Well, now we know a lot of things we didn't know in those days. We know about something called the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal axis, and we know that conscious cerebral thought can influence the immune system. This is well documented. It's been documented in laboratories. It's been documented in large studies. But all they knew was the rather gross uh, statement that if we're good, if we show real interest, if we sit with a patient and hold that patient's hand, there is a better likelihood that person will recover and do well than if not. So this went on until about the 13th or 14th century. Uh, the great days of the Muslim Renaissance began to fade. Uh, right after the First Crusade, as a matter of fact, but got even worse uh, when there was so much infighting among the different groups of, of Muslim philosophers, uh, very much like today, only it's much worse today. And lo and behold, uh, finally Constantinople, the bastion of the East, 
was conquered in 1453, and all of those Greek manuscripts, the original Greek manuscripts, found their way back to the West. And people rediscovered Hippocrates. People rediscovered Galen, other great Greek physicians. What people did not rediscover was the notion of goodness. And one of the reasons they didn't rediscover it was that the Renaissance was occurring. And the Renaissance, as you will recall, uh, celebrated the human body, among other things, and classical knowledge. But the idea was to learn as much objectively about the human body as one could. The Greeks didn't do that. The Greeks never dissected the human body. Their notions of anatomy were incorrect, but it didn't really make very much difference. But you get into the Renaissance, and we find that dissection is taking place. And wonderful works of art, anatomical works of art, are being put together not just by artists, but by anatomists. One of the best known names, probably the best known name, is Vesalius. And the Renaissance finally, as it's ending, culminates in the Enlightenment with a separation of what we might call objectivity from religion and increasing emphasis on science, increasing emphasis on the scientific method with no emotional content whatsoever. This results in new findings in anatomy, new findings in the concepts of disease, and then in the notion that when I do a physical examination on someone, says an Enlightenment physician, uh, I am finding out what's going on inside the body, and my job is to carefully follow my patients till they die and hope that they will die so that I can dissect their bodies. And, and if you look at the late 18th and early 19th century, it is a period, and this goes on into the late 19th century, of what's called therapeutic nihilism in the great academic centers. Nobody thought about treatment. Nobody much cared about treatment. Now, your local physician was likely to, but I'm talking about the leaders of medicine, the academic leaders. And one day, in the year 1813, here is Paris, the center now of medicine, because as a result of the French Revolution, the city is filled with young people. Half of them have tuberculosis. The, the other half have dysentery. Who knows what they have? The hospitals of Paris are filled with young, healthy people. And doctors are flocking from all over the Western world and the Eastern world, China, Japan, Russia, everything in between to study with the great French physicians. And how do the great French physicians study them? They make rounds with huge retinues of patients, uh, doctors, young doctors. They examine their patients and they do this system that I described a moment ago. They make very little attempt, except in the rudiments of surgery, make very little attempt to cure, don't look for cure, but follow patients and then themselves do autopsies so that they can learn about the processes of disease. They don't care about patients. Some of the great physicians, French physicians of the early 19th century, uh, Guillaume Dupitron, the greatest surgeon of the time, and others prided themselves on being cruel to patients. And that had to do with distancing. But the ultimate distancing occurs in the year 1813, or starts to occur in 1813, when a young doctor at a small hospital outside of Paris, who's in charge of the lung unit, the pulmonary unit, a lot of tuberculosis, a fellow named René Lenec is making rounds. And René Lenec is about five feet, two inches tall. And his middle name is Hyacinth. And he's never had a date in his life, and he's 39 years old, and he's scared of girls. And on this particular afternoon, he describes this in the book he wrote. I'm not making this up for the sake of being in Portland. Uh, <laughs> and he comes across a young, attractive woman uh, just a little bit 
obese, and he has to listen to the lower lobe of her left lung, which is located right under her nipple. And of course, another complicating factor is that the French of those days, and perhaps of these days, never bathed. Uh, you got a bath when you were born, you got a bath the night before you married, and you got a bath the night before they put you in your grave. So the place stank, which, and you know, this is why perfume was invented in the 18th century. And, and he, he didn't know what to do. He was so nervous about looking at this woman that he canceled rounds and he left. And he's walking home and he walks across the courtyard of the Louvre, which at that time was a palace. And he sees some boys playing a game that he used to play when he was young. They take a long piece of wood, two by two, and one kid scratches with a pin a prearranged signal on one end, and the other kid's listening on the other end, and he hears the signal, and Rene Teofil Hyacinth Lenek says, oh my God, I have it. I guess he didn't say that. I guess he said, sacre bleu. And he called a passing cab, a cabriolet, as they were called. He goes back to the hospital, and he rolls up a notebook. And he puts the notebook under the breast of this succulent young, ooh, did I say that? Um, succulent young woman. I'm at a loss for words thinking about her. And, and with this one fell swoop, he invents the stethoscope. The first stethoscopes were called batons or cylinders because they were wooden uh, instruments. He carved many of them himself. And later on, uh, of course, all the refinements occurred so that now uh, when you look at a commercial, you'll see a young doctor always in greens with a thing wrapped around her neck. Uh, a lot of comments were made when he wrote his book in 1819 describing the sounds. The book was a bestseller. Everybody wanted to look at this new instrument. Some people complained they couldn't hear the sounds that he described. They had names like whispered pectoriloquy, whatever that may be. They were hard to remember. Some people said, I hear too much. I can't, I can't use this thing. Some people said, oh, they will impress patients because there's something mechanical. And some people say patients would be put off by them. But the most sagacious said, for the first time in the history of medicine, all of our years, something is physically separating us from our patients. This is a metaphor for the future. From now on, we better worry about what little humanity is left in us, and we better start thinking about improving it well. Of course, a lot of lip service was given to that kind of thing. And we are left with the situation that I really came here to speak about this evening, which is the way of modern death in the early 21st century. And let me illustrate it by a small anecdote. When I was still in practice, I was one day during my last semester of practice seeing a woman who had had a carcinoma of the breast operated on about five years before, and she'd had an early stage breast cancer, and it was pretty obvious that she was cured. And she would come every six months for, oh, a mammogram and a physical examination. And she was sort of an upbeat, very pleasant woman. And this, on this particular day, she was morose, unhappy. And obviously, I asked her what it was, and she said, well, you know, my mother had breast cancer, and I had had a very poor relationship with my mother. I hadn't seen her since I was 16. This woman was now in her late 30s. She was an attorney in New Haven. And when I heard about it, I asked her to come and move to New Haven and be with me so that I could care for her. I saw, she said, I envisioned a rapprochement. I envisioned a coming together after all of these years. Well, toward the end, she said she developed pneumonia. She was in the hospital in the ICU. And she said none of the good things ever happened. And then she said one of the things that really got me started thinking about this, this book, How We Die, 
what did I do wrong? Well, of course, she hadn't done a thing wrong. The very nature of the kind of disease that had carried off her mother was the problem. But more importantly than that, her mother fell into the hands of a very high-tech university hospital group of what we now call intensivists and was given treatment that the Greeks never would have given because they would have recognized, as any good physician should recognize, that any attempt to enable this woman to then go home or live some sort of a useful life to herself was an exercise in futility and they would have stepped back and they would have not only provided comfort care, but they would have provided some comfort, some solace for the family. All of this made me think back on my own experience in medical school. Like so many people of my generation, and I'm convinced of the present generation too, uh, I entered medical school uh, completely idealistic. I think, I think it's the same now, regardless of what you hear my friends on admissions committees tell me. The kids have the same idealism that they ever had. It's just that we're better at beating it out of them than we were. So, you know, you get, on the, you get into your second year and you start looking through a microscope and you get very excited about what you see. And what you see is not a human being, obviously, it's a bit of tissue. And then when you get on the wards, what really is exciting is the disease process. It's the riddle of diagnosis. It's the riddle of therapy. You begin to think of the patient as someone who has been good enough to bring you a disease so that you can study it. Now, those of you who are in a particular profession or a particular line of work that has a history to it, know that part of training in that profession is to model you after the people who are in that profession. It's like Marine boot camp. After 12 weeks, you come out of there, and your hair isn't just shaved off, but you're a Marine. You are like everybody else, and that is what medical training does for our idealistic young people. It converts them into young people, and this has been true incidentally since the early 1960s. It converts them into young people for whom the patient becomes the focus of a disease process and not the focus of a human process. So that when the patient nears death and you have, with your colleagues, been using all of your efforts to stop that patient from dying, you have been taught by the end of your training to consider it a failure if you do not succeed. Every doctor in this room remembers mortality and morbidity conferences where every death is discussed. And the young surgical resident, the young pediatric resident, internal medicine resident, whose patient this was, is made to feel as though a mistake was made. This is a pedagogical thing. This is how you learn, supposedly. I don't think I have ever lost a patient without being sure on some level that it was my fault. That, you know, even when I was a mature surgeon all of those years, and that came from training, we fear death. We fear death. By we, I mean physicians, obviously, because it is a sign of failure. I want to read a quote that I pulled out of uh, a medical journal. It wasn't in one of the medical articles. December of 2009, so it's uh, almost four years ago now. Uh, it was about the UCLA Medical Center, a pretty, pretty fair country academic medical center. And the reporter wrote, the medical reporter wrote, uh, UCLA Medical Center has earned a reputation as a place where doctors will go to virtually any length and expense to try to save a patient's life. And then they quote the CEO. I have his name, but I won't, I won't tell you what it is. It, quote, if you come into this hospital, we're not going to let you die. <laughs> terrific. That's just terrific. 
You know, we're all amused by it in, in, on this lovely day in Portland when we're separated from it. Some of, it well, some of us, of course, are very close to it. But, but we, we are somewhat separated from this phenomenon. We don't let people die. Uh, certainly not on my shift isn't this, is this person going to die. So that is one of the reasons that we have been left with a medical atmosphere in which people toward the end of life are treated beyond what the Hippocratic physicians would consider a realistic prognosis. The physicians fear a failure, but there's something better yet. You know, one of the interesting kinds of literature I've in passing looked at from time to time are the psychological studies of people in different professions and what makes them go into the profession. Of course, it's always a mix of, of reasons. But guess which of our professions, occupations, has members with the highest fear of death compared, compared to other occupations? You guessed it. Doctors. It's like, who has the greatest fear of heights? You'll never get on an airplane when I tell you the answer. <laughs> it's pilots. You know, we, we do these things to overcome our fears. And I thought back about my own life where I grew up in a family where, oh my God, people were dying one after the other. From the time I was a little boy, death was in the legend and lore of my family. I, the disease scared the hell out of me. And I'm sure that was one of my motives in, in becoming a doctor. So people carry this kind of thing through medical school. Physicians, for all of our vaunted stature, tend to be somewhat emotionally fragile. Now, we do have a higher rate of depression than other groups. People attribute it to the work we do. But the work we do is also enormously rewarding. I think we have a higher rate of depression because we are a pre-selected group. I think we are emotionally fragile. I think we need certain kinds of emotional rewards that are very different from the emotional rewards of most people in the, in the population. And one of them is conquering disease. So what do we do at the end of life? We double our efforts. And what complicates this even further? Who are the teachers of the young people training? Are they the sage men and women with gray hair and 25 years of experience? Yes, they make rounds once a week. But the bedside teachers, the people that they're with at the emergencies, uh, when a, a crash is called, when a patient is intubated, they're about three or four years older than the young doctors. They are residents a couple of years ahead. That's who does the moment-to-moment -moment teaching. That's who young doctors identify with. They identify with the young hotshot who is saving life, who is making a brilliant diagnosis and who doesn't know or care very much about the patient at all. Nowadays, of course, this is all complicated by the advent of this lovely notion called hospitalists. Uh, I was told about a physician who is sitting in this room who continues to see his own patients at a major hospital, and I was astounded. How does he do that? If I were in practice, they, well, if I'm not in internal medicine, but if I were, I wouldn't be allowed at the Yale New Haven Hospital to see my patients. So here we are. We're making decisions at the end of life that involve knowing someone's values, that involve understanding his or her religious beliefs, that involve knowing that the family is not a monolith, that there are five or six people in this family. We've got to know a little bit about each one of them. And dying patients are being treated by a young woman or a young man who never saw them before this final admission. So these are the problems that we, that we face today. These are the difficulties. And how, how do we provide hope 
when patients themselves begin to realize, families begin to realize, that although the doctor is urging more and more, the likelihood of success is less and less. How do we provide hope for such people? How do we provide hope for someone who knows that he has just failed chemotherapy for the second time and the next round isn't going to do a bit of good? Well, if we are the physicians that the Greeks talked about, if we are the phys physicians who love humankind, as a matter of fact, if we are the physicians who want to provide an image, what I call the pastoral image of the physician, we provide hope, but we don't give up reality. We make certain promises to patients who we know are going to die. We promise people they will not die alone. How many people die alone in intensive care units in our teaching hospitals? Hundreds of thousands every year. Forgetting about the people who die alone in a completely different category, namely nursing homes throughout this country where people have no connections, no relationships, because no one's been to visit them or take care of them for a while. We can also give people the sense that we will not persist in extraordinary measures. We will be like the Greeks. We will use our skill at prognosis to back off. We were talking, I can't remember who it was with, but it's someone in this audience a little earlier about how physicians treat other physicians at the end of life. And some here may be familiar with the studies that uh, physicians at the end of life are far less likely to pursue complex treatments because they know what the truth is. And they, they simply do not want themselves and their families to be put through this. We provide hope also by something that I see far too little of at the end of life from all of us with those who are dying who are people that we love. I think the most important thing one can do for a loved one who is dying is to reassure that person about what their life has meant to us. And it's kind of interesting. I've seen doctors of a certain psychological set who would meet a patient perhaps in the last week before that patient died, and somehow convey to that person that just meeting him was a refreshing experience. Just meeting him and knowing a little bit about his past was an experience that enriched one's own life. Vaclav Havel writes a book called Disturbing the Peace. You might remember they were essays he wrote in prison. And one of the essays is about hope. And here's what he says about hope. Hope does not consist of expecting things to turn out well. It consists of hoping that things will make sense at the end. And these are things that make sense. These are the things that we need to do. Change this? Well, we've tried to change it. We've tried to change it over the years. Uh, you all know about the rise of the bioethics movement in the 1960s and how all sorts of bioethical principles have dealt with the end of life. It gave us the Patient Self Determination Act of 1990, which supposedly allows every patient to decide what they want in life sustaining treatment. And uh, as we were discussing earlier with a few people, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work for several reasons. The person who signed the declaration is a very different person than the person who's dying. We sit here and we're all conscious and we're smart and we're at the top of our form and we go to our lawyer's office or wherever it may be and we sign one of these forms. At the end of life, our values change. The people around us want something that we may not want. There is nothing worse than familial conflict 
at the end of life. There is nothing worse than a person dying who is not spelled out to everyone in the family what it is that he or she really wants, forgetting about what's written on the piece of paper. This is a verbal kind of thing so that it, everybody accepts it. You know, here's mom on a respirator, and it's understood that uh, she's close to being brain dead and the respirator should be stopped. And uh, she has these uh, lovely advanced directives. And everybody says, good, that's a good thing. And in flies Susie from Dubuque, who hasn't seen mom in three years. Didn't even call her last Christmas. Susie from Dubuque. I didn't make this up. You know, this, is, this goes on every day. Susie from Dubuque is feeling guilty about everything, and she, everything must be done for my mother, and there go mom's advanced directives and her careful planning. Or a young doctor comes plunging into the intensive care unit, has no idea what the advanced directives are, and he plunges a tube down mom's throat. We've got to change, we've got to change the system. And I'm not quite sure how much time I have left, but I'm, I'm getting uh, the look, uh, the hook. And so here's my, here's my solution. And I've written about this and engaged in debates about this, so it's not a half-baked thing. I've committed myself to it. There is nothing in medical care in this country that is not intertwined with everything else in medical care. We talk about medical care, but we really mean medical services. It really means what doctors get paid for. We talk about the problems of educating physicians in such a way that they become Spitfire pilots and just want to shoot down the Messerschmitts and don't think about the patient in the bed. We think about the fact that young people want to go into medicine are turned away from the humanities, like English literature, like philosophy, like the history of Western thought that can provide so much in decision making at the bedside. We worry about that, that the pre-medical requirements are so dreadful now that there's very little in the humanities. So there are many, many factors and we can't solve any problem the Affordable Care Act, hatefully called Obamacare, will not solve very many of our problems. It is a good beginning. You know what we need? In 1906, American medical education was probably the worst in the world. There was one medical school in this country based on the German model, that was Johns Hopkins. And in most other medical schools, of which there were 155 in Canada and the United States, most other medical school science was not at a premium at all. Uh, there, a lot of them were proprietary schools owned by groups of doctors. And the Carnegie Foundation decided something had to be done, and they hired a young educator. His name was Abraham Flexner. And within four years, he published what's called the Flexner Report of the Carnegie Foundation, in which he re recommended a complete overhaul of medical education. And then got from Carnegie, Rockefeller, and private philanthropy hundreds of millions of dollars to bribe the 35 schools of the 155 that he thought ought to survive. To bribe them to make affiliations with hospitals so that kids could study on the wards. Bribe them to create laboratories and have real scientists teaching and doing research. And everything was based on the Hopkins, which was the German model. 1910, by 1925, America was the center of medical education. Students were no longer wanting in postgraduate courses to go to France or to go to Germany. They all came here, and that's continued. My notion is we did it once. We did it only with education. We now need to do it with everything. We need to turn, we need to examine the entire system, recreate it. Medical care was actually built, you know, like Topsy. Whatever Band-Aid was put on in 1948, uh, whatever plaster was put on in 1965, it was just a stopgap. We don't have a system. 
One of the reasons that socialist systems have worked reasonably well in Europe is that they were started right after World War II when there was no insurance industry to fight and not very much big pharma to fight. It will cost probably tens of billions of dollars, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars, but what's more important than health? What's more important than the health of a nation? Nothing. We need a new Flexner report. I don't know whether a foundation or any found group of foundations is rich enough to do it. I think, I think the, the country has to do it. The federal government has to do it. And how do we get it started? At the risk of using a couple of more minutes, I'll tell you a personal anecdote. I have four children. Two of them were born the old-fashioned way. Mama lying on what was essentially an operating table with her, with her toes pointed to the two corners of the room and every hair beneath her waist shaven off, uh, delivered by a fellow of the American Academy of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Everything was covered in green and all the dads were outside walking furrows in the carpet. It wasn't very rewarding until the kid came out and we saw it. My second two kids were delivered by a midwife. There was an obstetrician somewhere nearby, I'm not quite sure where, in a birthing bed, which was exactly the kind of bed the kid, kids were conceived in in the first place. The atmosphere is magnificent. I was the, the, the nurse practitioner's assistant, and not because I'm a surgeon, but because I was dad, she let me cut the cord, and it, it was very exciting. And I'd been very skeptical. You know, I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon. I, just very, very skeptical about this whole scene. So this kid comes out with his great big head of red hair, which he still has today, 32 years later. And I look down at his mother. The placenta isn't even out yet. And I said, what caused this change? Tears are rolling. Imagine a surgeon with tears rolling down his face. I said, what? made this change, and she looks up at me and she says, these were her exact words, the women's movement, dummy. <laughs> That's what we need. We had a women's movement, we had a civil rights movement, we had a gay rights movement, and they all came from the people. They didn't come from elected officials. They came as a result of a huge groundswell. Obviously, there were some leaders in every one of these movements, but basically, those leaders were motivated by their followers, and that's what we need now. We need studies, we need recommendations, and throughout all of their studies and recommendations, the chosen authorities who work on this should be guided by the admonition of the Hippocratic authors to whom medicine was, by whom medicine was called the art, and prognostication was one of its most highly regarded skills. Medicine now, no less than then, is the art of nurturing the sick to a state of health and to recognize when it is impossible to do so. Should that be the case, should we find that it is impossible to do so in the case of any individual patient, ways must be found to demedicalize the final days or weeks, to nurture the dying and those who love them, and by this means, as physicians, as family members, to nurture ourselves because the real truth of healing lies in the nurture. Thank you very much for inviting me today. If, uh, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and there'll be somebody around. Come around and bring a mic to you. Yes. I saw this gentleman first. Uh, thank you very much for coming. If I don't re for coming? <laughs> you, sir, um, to Portland. 
Um, <laughs> if, if I can't remember the exact figures, but there are Medicare statistics, which I'm sure you know exactly, that indicate that, that uh, in the final weeks or in the final week or the final two days, so much of the cost of medicine is involved in treating patients uh, as they come down to that, that critical week or that tri critical two days. And when you say that studies should be guided by the Hippocratic values, um, I wonder that how much of an obstacle in your mind is it going to be that follow the precept of follow the money, that the obstacles of removing that source of money for the system, wherever it's going, is so huge that it's going to be great resistance to doing what you and I happen to agree with um, advocate. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, the, the usual figures quoted are uh, one third of Medicaid funds are spent in the last six months of life. And we do know that a significant amount of that is wasted. We also know, and there are plenty of studies, uh, one, of whom, one of which actually appeared in the New Yorker by Atul Gawande some, some years ago, uh, that indicate that the profit motive is something much greater than we had ever dreamed of. Uh, you know that it was possible until about 15 years ago for doctors to own the laboratories that they referred patients to and the x-ray machines until the so-called Sparks Amendment came along to stop it, but it hasn't stopped it very much. Uh, if I were a member of this commission, instead of waiting for conclusions after making many, many years of observations, there were, certain, there were certain things I would demand. And I would demand that the entire medical system be put on a non-fee basis, that doctors be on salaries. I think that's an absolute necessity. The profit motive is a complex thing, and it isn't always as obvious as we think. Doctors make decisions uh, on a whole range of, of levels, some of which are conscious, some of which are unconscious. Uh, someone is having pain in his right upper quadrant, and he seems to recover pretty nicely with medication and doesn't need to have his gallbladder out. Uh, I'm a surgeon, I'm prejudiced toward taking his gallbladder out, but somewhere in the back of my head, uh, I say to myself, gee, wouldn't it be nice to have three or four gallbladders to do next week because I've got empty spaces on my on my schedule. This sounds rather crass, but I think these motives, although they are not as conscious as we might think, are very high motivating factors. Uh, I think the relationship between doctors and drug companies it causes a huge waste of, of money. Uh, I think medical advertising uh, is a huge waste of money. I, uh, when I was on the board of the Hastings Center, I used to have to drive from uh, the Hudson River across Route 84 uh, into Connecticut, and as I passed into Connecticut each time, I'd see this gigantic billboard that said, Danbury Hospital, the best cardiac surgery in Connecticut. Danbury Hospital? <laughs> What happened to Yale New Haven? What happened to, to St. Francis in Hartford, St. Raphael's in, in New Haven? What happened to the University of Connecticut system? You can say anything on the billboard. Uh, you look at the, I don't know if the New York Times is popular up this far north, but uh, any Sunday, look at the advertisements for the Mayo Clinic and, and this is, this is gigantic amounts of money, which are never calculated and never thought about. But to go back to the original uh, notion of the profit motive, I think there should never be a profit motive. Uh, this, putting doctors on salary will save a lot of problems. One is, why should a cardiac surgeon earn uh, uh, literally 10 times what a pediatrician earns? Uh, pediatricians and geriatricians are among our most valuable source of health care as our family physicians. But nowadays, people want to go into dermatology. I can't tell you how stuffed the dermatology residencies and the allergy residencies and the plastic 
surgery residencies are with applications, whereas certain other residencies, including some in basic surgery, general surgery, are going, are going begging. Uh, Yale, uh, uh, one of our universities in Connecticut, Quinnipiac, just opened a medical school, new medical school. Somebody gave them 100 million bucks, and they will admit nobody unless they promise to, to stay in family practice. That's what we need. That's the kind of thing we need. We need much more skillful use of nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, to do a lot of the basic technical things that physicians don't really need to do. There are so many things, but number one, a priori, no doctor should ever earn any money for whatever she or he provides as a service. I don't know whether it was apocryphal or true, and you could verify this, but nothing encouraged me more than when I heard, rightly or wrongly, that there were a number of physicians, probably male, who had tattooed on their chests DNR in fear that if something should happen and they were part of a, in a hospital, that their colleagues would have a terribly hard time of allowing them to be released from life. And I thought, oh, God, what a, that just said to me, OK, physicians or surgeons, whoever, are waking up. And along with it, they're saying, most of us, if we were really honest, would never prescribe for ourselves what we prescribe for the patient. So there's the beginning of this honesty coming up through, and I don't know what generation of physicians this is, but I'm encouraged greatly. And when I went to nursing school, 6061, I learned there, back then, that student, medical students were taught to spot pathology. They wouldn't recognize health if they met it in broad daylight. To spot pathology and either eradicate it through surgery, through chemo, through radiation. And it was, I, I was shocked, I mean just shocked, paying no attention to nu nutrition. And in the huge thick book on OBGYN, one paragraph in 1960-61 on breastfeeding. Well, it's worse than you think. <laughs> Actually, what I have on my chest is, I love you, Mom. Uh, I, I haven't heard that particular anecdote, and it's a little hard to believe, but here's what I do know. I do know, and we were talking about this to someone earlier, that, that there are plenty of studies showing that uh, doctors as a group are far less likely to want uh, big stuff done at the end of life. And doctors have great respect for one another, and they tend to honor, honor those things. You know, once you've spent a few thousand hours in an ICU, as I have, and as I'm sure some members of the audience have, you never, ever, ever, ever want any doctor under the age of 45 to get near you. Because <laughs> over 45, they can't leap onto the gurney the way the younger folks do. <laughs> Can you give us any examples of either healthcare systems that are moving in the direction that you're talking about, or specializations, or movements? And I'm thinking about maybe the patient centered medical home movement, or the large prepaid group practices where the physicians are not on fee for service, they're on salaries. Are they moving in the direction you're talking about? Uh, let's go back to uh, the uh, Lyndon Johnson era, the Great Society era of 1965-66, and whatever they called it, the campaign against heart disease, cancer, and stroke. The leading medical consultant at that time was a man named Michael DeBakey, who was uh, the leading cardiac surgeon in this country. and. Uh, extraordinarily well-educated man in, in liberal arts and humanities. And he developed the notion of what he called centers of excellence. That in every state, uh, depending on geographic area, sometimes on other considerations, there would be one center that represented the teaching hospital, the medical school, and 
radiating out from that would be hospitals in the community connected to the medical center who hired only the number of physicians needed in a particular specialty. Everybody was to be on salary. And the basis of how this was going to work, although he didn't spell this out well enough, was the community health center. The community health center, which made use of the skills of nurse practitioners, of physicians' assistants, perhaps under the leadership of a physician. But this would allow, of course, health care to come into our inner cities. You know, one of our problems in America is access. It, it's really, I'm, I'm sorry to go off on a bit of a tangent, but one of the, one of the phenomena that drives me crazy is when my colleagues come back from Bechuanaland or Southeast Asia telling me about the great works they've done there during their quick two-week expedition, and six blocks away from my hospital is the inner city where 13-year-old girls are getting pregnant without any prenatal care. And, you know, the two criteria that the World Health Organization uses for health systems are uh, life expectancy and infant mortality, and that's why we lag behind. We lag behind because we have a poor, the biggest poor population of any Western nation, and we don't provide for them. Our life expectancy is lower because life expectancy does not depend on medical care. It depends on social services. It depends on water supply. It depends on vaccination. It depends on pre and post natal care. And we're not any good at that. So I'm talking about an entire system that starts with the community health center and goes up to the most sophisticated part of that system. So there's no redundancy. There is so much redundancy in this country. I'll look at my own state of Connecticut where there are at least half a dozen community hospitals that have no reason to exist except the board of directors are proud, proud of what they have. Oh, we have a breast cancer center. Oh, we have a cancer care center. Oh, we have a cardiac surgeon here. They don't need it at all. All of this can be filtered through a central system. I think the money is all there. We're just wasting it right now. And again, as someone pointed, as you pointed out, the end of life is the place where so much of that money is being lost. We've got one more question. Time for one more question. Well, I've just, I want to absolve the medical profession from a cultural sense that you address, which is that the values you spoke about of love of humanity are, they don't characterize our culture as it's known by the world. I've just come from a week-long retreat uh, led by an Asian, Tokni Rinpoche, on aging. And to listen to what some of these people are addressing uh, it has to do with our own deficits in the area of love and responsiveness. Fears of death. Who's working with what death is for people and what it really is? If you're a unit of person like me with green burial, what we are doing is reconverting. Our cells are going to turn into earthworms. We're lucky the earthworm gets taken by a bird and, you know, maybe it'll sing a song we couldn't sing. And if you become... If, that, if that's what death is and you become comfortable with death, now you move to the next thing, which is where you're talking about not dying alone. We need to work with love and loss. And for that poor person zooming in from uh, Omaha, you know, who has been suffering only belatedly a little guilt of the connection, that's not love and loss in the same way. So I think those issues that permeate our culture, we've got to re-educate our sense as... I'm sure you do in your book, about what life is about and need to go about it very intentionally. I've sat, just as you illustrated, as a, a social worker at, at Mass General Hospital with a doctor who had to tell a group of Italians that their mother had died on the operating table. And she, you, he was using all the technical language there was, but they didn't speak technique. You know, respirations have stopped, blood pressure, da 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 da, -da. And I'm trying to mouth to him, she died. But these are not words that now I understand it was fear. I thought it was a sense of, you know, his personal 
vulnerability about having to share this loss with them. But it wasn't that, I think. But, you know, I, I resonate with what you're saying, but I think what you're addressing is in one profession where this broader illness, this broader toxicity, uh, the medical profession has absorbed the infection uh, of our culture. Such obviously a complex issue that you've raised, and the issue involves the question of the fear of death in general, and not just in our society, but the natural fear of death that all human beings have. Human beings are the only creatures that have any sense of their own coming death. Even animals who see many deaths among their kin have no notion of what death is. Uh, there are entire philosophical schools based on the concept that death is the most motivating factor in all of our behavior. Uh, I always get a little scared when I hear that word Rinpoche because we have found a man trained, I think only men if I'm not mistaken, trained in certain techniques that bring serenity and understanding, trained at the cost of giving up so much in life. We have to live in this world. We can't all be Rinpoches. Uh, Dr. Majid asked me earlier, uh, I think during lunch, whether I thought that medicine could be the leader toward world peace, and I said yes. And I said yes because I think medicine is the ultimate expression of, of human culture, and that it's the culture of medicine. You put your finger right on it. It's the culture of medicine that needs to be changed. And I think if we change the culture of medic medicine, we can go a little bit closer toward changing the acquisitive, acquisitive, not inquisitive, acquisitive culture of our country in particular and of just about all Western society. And now increasingly Eastern society, because Japan and China and India are certainly not immune to this kind of thing. So thank you very much for bringing that up. And thank you so much.